Well, we've had a great afternoon, great day, and um, we've got some wonderful, wonderful uh, people to, uh, I guess, hear about their stories, um, about employment, their journeys thus far. Um, I think everyone already knows me, so there's no point in me introducing myself. But what I will do, though, is I will ask um, each of you to just say who you are and where you're from and how long you've been working there for. So I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name's Aaron, and I am currently working for SAP. And I've been there for about two years in a project admin sort of role. And I've also been handling the financial reporting. Correct. So my name's Brittany and I currently work for Cow Australia as a shared service officer. I've been there for about eight months now. Hi everyone, I'm Adam. Um, I'm working with the Victorian Government of Health and Human Services and I've been there for about a year. Hi everyone, my name's Ray. I uh, work here at ANZ and I've been here for about 18 months. I work as an analyst in the document knowledge management section. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Jan. Um, I, well, as far as my badge says it, I work for DXC, but contracted to ANZ um, as a cybersecurity analyst and I've been working there for, yeah, the eight months of the duration of um, the Spectrum program that they've got. And, and Jan, just while you've got the, mi the microphone, sure. um, tell us a little bit about the, the role itself. And um, yeah, tell us a little bit about the role itself. Um, well, in so far as what my role is in yep. cybersecurity, it's largely based on, I guess, building up a, a knowledge base of uh, possible threats or in incidences of, of threats uh, using a certain number of um, reporting tools. Um, and in this case, it's threats that come through email, which uh, at the moment is still one of the largest threat vectors that enterprises uh, have to deal with. Um, I... Um, do you want me to go on? Or? Uh, tell me a little bit maybe about um, your strengths and okay. how, and, and maybe even your interests and how they may relate to your work that you do. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, um, again, it's, it's, kind, it's kind of hard to um, report on one's own strengths just because um, they're kind of defined in how others see your, you as it, yep. your utility. Fair but, enough. Um, it's um, I, yeah, I would say I have quite a generally quite a uh, broad range of, of interests and um, a broad knowledge base, and um, I'm told that I have an ability to sort of learn things fairly quickly. Um, and you know, I I I enjoy learning things. I enjoy kind of going down the rabbit hole in in sort of investigations and and things like that. So uh, that is um, how I find myself. Uh, of use to uh, the role that I'm currently in. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Ro, could you um, tell us a little bit about your role itself uh, and um, talk a little bit about perhaps your strengths and in, in what you bring to that role? Yeah, sure. I get to work in the really sexy area of documents. So, <laughs> um, you know, like it's, it's not the most sexy area, right, but it's an important part of any big organisation, the documentation that you send out. In this case, we're talking about a financial services organisation, so when someone gets a letter of offer for a loan or whatever, we get to make sure that goes out the way it should go out. Has the right customer's information on it, so on and so forth. So um, having said that, my role is mainly around um, analysis and design of um, how the document is going to be put together, um, how we're talking to the other systems within the bank that are going to talk to our system to eventually spit out that document that the customer will see, whether that be a physical document or whether that be a digital document. Um, so, yeah, not very sexy but kind of critical. Um, as for my strengths, I echo what Jan says. 
asking autistic people what their strengths are, we're really crap at saying what our strengths are. <laughs> um, Characteristics. Yeah, we're kind of good. But um, I'm told I'm good at... Um, I have good analytical skills. I'm good at asking questions outside the box. Um, I'm good at speaking up when I don't like something. <laughs> Andrew sitting over there can probably testify to that. <laughs> um, and anyone who's been involved with me in any way can testify to the fact that, it, that you know... If things are there, I'll call it out, right? I'll ask the question. It doesn't mean what I say goes, but I'll ask the question, um, which I think in a role where you need to have analytical skills, I think that's a really important part of that. Um, it's really important um, to have organisations where that's actually a safe thing to do, where that's actually something that is actually supported and encouraged because... That's obviously better for business that you end up with a solution or a design or a product or whatever that's actually kind of gone through the ringer of design and people saying, but what about or what about, but if we do that, it won't, etc. So I'll probably roll, rambled on a bit much, so I'll pass the mic. Thanks. So, so Adam, just so that we're clear, I'm not asking you about what you think your strengths are, how other people would perceive <laughs> your strengths. Roger. <laughs> okay. Okay, so our role at the DHHS is they have a warehouse full of thousands upon thousands of boxes full of personnel data, uh, health records, patient files, and so on. So our role is to take this data and just capture it into an online uh, database, like electronic docu document records management. Um, okay, uh, my team members would say my skills are public speaking, uh, written communication skills, um, the ability to think outside the box, and observational skills. Excellent. Thank you. So my position um, at CAL as a shared services officer um, does include uh, various different tasks such as um, tech and asset management support, um, management with our staff shop, um, education booking for our salon division, um, as well as invoicing and travel requests for the organisation um, and management of the consumer care centre. So my greatest strengths um, that I guess my employers would say would be um, my loyalty, my communication skills um, and being able to show empathy to others. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you. Okay, so my greatest strengths is I believe to be my uh, logical brain, which I believe benefits my employer by quickly and efficiently working through complex issues and project management trying to get them the information they need as soon as possible so decisions can be made with uh, accuracy. And what was the next bit? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, actually yeah. we can just um, completely flip it now and talk, <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about um, actually before you started working yep. and perhaps talk about some of the challenges that, that, that you faced prior to getting your job. Uh, some of the key challenges I faced was really, uh, first of all, when I was trying to get a job, I had quite a lot of difficulty articulating what my strengths were. And as you all are aware, that's always a very difficult part. But particularly for someone on the spectrum, it can be exceptionally challenging because you do not believe what you do is any particular strength. You sort of believe that it's something everyone can do because it just comes so naturally. Yeah. And uh, another challenge I had was it was very hard for me to start work. I just needed a lot of flexibility in my work hours to begin off with, particularly starting part-time, some flexible hours in the day, and SAP really provided that for me. Right, thank you. Brittany, could you... Um Talk a little bit about some of that. that yeah, of course. So obviously through um, the interview process, um, similar to Adam, obviously self-doubt. Um, so whilst I was actively looking for employment um, and applying for various different roles, I did always have in the back of the, my mind that I may not be good enough or the person in front of me um, may be a better suit to the role. So I guess that did get in the way for a lot of potential um, roles. 
but I guess once I turned off that negative thinking, um, I did find myself with various um, different roles that would be suited to me. Thanks. Yes, um, I had experiences similar to those who just here. Um, I'm not the most natural salesman in the world, so in interviews I had trouble selling my strengths. And um, I, I just um, another thing for me was uh, the, uh, disclosure. I wasn't sure whether to disclose my condition or not, and um, I thought that if I didn't, it would impact negatively on my chances. And if I did, then uh, you know. Uh, they treat me differently anyway. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. So there was always a problem for me, the thing of disclosure. And that anxiety saying, perhaps you're not good enough for this job. Uh, you just have to kind of get that little voice and suppress it. Okay, can I just ask, Adam, so yeah. uh, as you were tarrying with that tension of disclosure, non-disclosure, what did you decide to do? Uh, well, for my current role, it was part of the process from the beginning because we were hired uh, via specialist term who uh, were specifically looking for people on the spectrum. But in previous interviews, I found it a real challenge. Okay. And usually I just decided not to disclose. Not to, okay, great, thanks. Yeah, that disclosure discussion is a really interesting one. I personally am an advocate for disclosure, um, but also recognize there are conditions around that sometimes. In some, some circumstances, it's actually not safe to do so. Um, some industries you'll be in, it's actually not safe to do so because you'll be treated not as an, or if you were successful um, in that role, you would be treated not as a colleague, but as like, um, like for example, if you're in education, you'll often be treated not as a fellow teacher, but as a, in the same way as the children, autistic children are treated. So it is a really, um, in, I, main I continue to maintain my support and advocacy for disclosure because I think we're different, not less, right? Mm. And um, we shouldn't be ashamed. We shouldn't feel any um, any remorse or um, <sighs> anything holding us back from disclosing who we are. Um, however, that needs to be tempered with a careful consideration of what that situation that you're in is. But that's not the answer to the question, is it, boys? Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a, that's a perfectly um, good um, uh, road to go down. But um, as for me, um, I am... Um, I leave behind me prior to my time at ANZ uh, a litany of shattered careers and half-started attempts. And um, the reality is that very few of those roles were were broken or shattered because I was incapable or unable to, to perform the role. They were because of not being able to negotiate a social the social contract or the communicative um, um, expectations, not requirements, but expectations of what was involved in conversations around the um, the water fountain, for want of a better word, or um, Things that were agreed about whether you go to a social event or something like that, like there, you, what you didn't actually understand that there's actually a requirement. It's almost required that you attend that Friday night drinks thing, and you miss out on a whole lot of information when you don't attend those things. Um, so yeah, that my um, and for me, looking for work was always fraught. And then when you throw in the fact that I'm an out visible trans woman. Uh, you've got a whole lot of complications that go with that. You've got a whole lot of discrimination that you have to negotiate. You've got a whole lot of um, issues that just make it that much harder, right? Um, and so <laughs> if you'd have told me two years ago that I was going to end up, that I would be sitting here today as uh, a successful part of uh, ANZ as an organisation, I probably would have laughed at you. But... Um, I don't think many people would have heard the story of the um, hackathon, so uh, you are perfectly entitled to, to tell it now. Um, uh, so a couple of years ago, ANZ sponsored a hackathon that the Autism CRC um, put together um, around uh, apps for translating some research into some apps to assist autistic people. Um, so I was a part of, voluntary part of the team that got that together, as was Voy and as was Judy, who's sitting over there. Um, 
And we got to the end of that hackathon and I kind of stood up on stage and had a little bit of a tantrum about the reality of what... Uh, I think you were there too, well, weren't you, well actually, well, actually, sorry, can I interject? So what had happened was the, the event had finished. So the judging had finished. Uh, Andrew Davis, our CEO... Um, who I'm thought he was closing now. the show, but he closed, wasn't. Closed, <laughs> and so everyone, you know what it's like. Events closed, everyone starts walking off, and, and then Ro comes over, picks up the microphone, and says... And I just said, look, essentially, well, you've just had an experience where you've worked with some autistic people over a couple of days. It's been a really successful thing. And actually, I know there's a, a, a some at least one member of those autist, autistic people that were part of that program in the room, so... Um, you know, that was, and there was a bunch of corporate people in front of me, of which there were some that were in uh, roles that had a, had an ability to influence um, what happened in their organisations, or so I thought. And so I kind of had a bit of a, I, I kind of refer to it as my little tantrum. Um, it probably wasn't, but I kind of refer to it that way. But anyway, I just outlined the fact that you know, many of us as autistic people, we've struggled to get work. We've got, we're um, employed well below our capacity and our expertise. And um, the reality is, at the time, the stats were 30% of autistic people have work. That's not just full-time work, that's any work, right? And, that, and you've just had this, so I said, basically, take this information back to your organisations and change the game. Um, <laughs> and, and so, um, and so, you got a job. Well, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, which was a good part of that tantrum. Yeah, but it wasn't kind. It wasn't exactly because of that. And and I will say, I'll say about that because six months later, I got a role here, um, which wasn't directly because of that. It was because of a couple of key people who were there put my name forward to someone that had the capacity to hire someone. So it wasn't directly, but um, and I will say that. There are times in your life where you have an opportunity and it could walk past you. And I didn't quite pick up the microphone after that everyone was packing up. I had actually backgrounded Cheryl who was there and said, Cheryl, I need the microphone. Get me the microphone. And she was a bit funny because she knew Andrew Davis wanted to have the last words, but she let me have it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I remember standing there speaking and I knew it was a powerful moment. I could tell from the reaction of people that it was having an impact. Um, but I was very much aware of, like I, ha I actually had this conscious thought at the time, this is not about me, this is about my tribe, particularly about my tribe's juniors. You know, I'm 48. I, you know what, I actually thought my chances of a career were over. I thought it was uh, I was gone. Here I was, I was an out trans woman in the middle of transition. The, the statistics for trans employment and autistic employment compiling together I thought I was done right I was just I was just trying to make it happen but I was like I want my peers to have a chance my peers bring skills they bring fantastic abilities they bring fantastic value to any organization they're involved in and I want them to have a go and I'm sorry I'm monopolizing the, mi monopolizing no, the microphone no, um, so that was kind of the story and that's kind of why how I ended up here and it's and it's a part of why the Spectrum program exists, um, which I mean, I don't want to say, oh, it's all because of me, but I'm. when I look back on the fact that um, there were some key people there that heard that, that encouraged them to push forward with some work that they'd already begun, um, it's a moment that's one of the moments of my life that I'm the most proud of. Thank you. Yep. So, Jan, you've been you've been waiting there for a bit. <laughs> yeah, no, don't no worry. But um, figure my phone. This uh, just I'm um, just referring to the, some of the notes here. Um, what? The, so the question was, what, what challenges was have I encountered? <laughs> you you yeah. can you can what talk about those if you'd like to. Like the, the I challenges? I yeah. haven't actually written anything in particular that's particularly unique to me. I've just said that um, yeah, the challenges that I've kind of faced in in trying to uh, enter the workforce out of after leaving um, higher education, I basically just characterised as the same as as anyone else really would in 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 my position, and that is that you're essentially just having to uh, navigate the uh, employment provider market mm. uh, 
or industry, um, and it's um, a, a lot of the time you get this feeling that people just want to um, sort of push you on to someone else. Um, you become more and more like a liability and you feel that um, sort of after um, trying to get through your um, all levels of education, you find that actually having a career isn't really something that is um, guaranteed or, or promised to you. Uh, it's, it's something mo that's more of a luxury. Um, and I think, I think yeah, uh, a, a lot of people of my generation um, feel, feel this way. Um, and I guess just having certain anxiety issues with that doesn't help. And I guess that's how my autism would, would play into that um, in, yeah, se severely demoralizing me. So, yeah. Um, so, you, so Jan, just tell us a little bit about the experience with the, the, the agencies. So, um, don't name any names, but, but, but how did you find, did they know, did they get a sense of who you were? Did they know the types of jobs that you might be good at? Um, how, how was that, how was the well, interaction with them? <laughs> Well, I, I don't I don't know how much how much of um how much of it was actually their fault or mine. Uh, I did not go through any uh, disability um, recruitment agencies, so okay. I guess um, I can't really speak for anyone's experiences in that. But um, it was essentially just to their essential. Um, <laughs> I I know that what I was the one that I was going through for a while was not did not have the best. Um, yeah, client reviews or whatever, but um, it was essentially a, a descendant of um, the very antiquated model of just trying to push for, to try to basically harass employers to see if they have any jobs available and just um, give them to uh, basically what uh, Andrew Beard was. Um, uh, describing in the early 80s, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. I, yeah. I, I, I don't have anything really unique to say. So. But That's so tell me maybe perhaps a little bit about what you like about working. What's the best thing about working now? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think just being um, employed sort of just provides that kind of assurance of society saying that you have something of, of value to offer uh, that you can you can at least you know come home at, at the end of the day and say well at least perhaps in in someone's eyes um, yeah your your time and your effort uh, wasn't wasted and you can sort of put any uh, anxieties about uh, the future and your life uh, to rest at least temporarily, and I'd say that that's quite a good thing. Thank you. Question, same yeah, same question. What's the best thing about working? Kind of helps to keep the lights on at night, right? Um, <laughs> you know, like number one is actually, like I, I, I'm not sure about you guys, your experience of past and, you know, having spotty careers and st you've just struggled for that normal kind of, normality of just a routine life um so like that's the first thing you know keep keep the lights on pay the bills make life happen keep the keep those normal kind of balls in the air it's an enabler yeah yeah, yeah it's an enabler but then like once you get past that there's and depending on your organization obviously but i I'm really fortunate to be part of an organisation where I'm actually encouraged to question, I'm encouraged to be curious, I'm encouraged to pursue leadership. So, you know, as, um, you know, here I am as an autistic person, supposed to be not very good at social and all that kind of thing, but it, I'm, I have a role as an analyst, but uh, aside from that, we work in squads. I work in a squad of 12 people. I'm the scrum master. I facilitate all the meetings. I organise all the meetings. I do all that, you know, like... I couldn't imagine that that was a possibility a couple of years ago. I just wouldn't have thought. I just, I didn't have the capacity to think that because I didn't have the capacity to think beyond. I just need something that's going to pay the bills every week so that I can keep life going. And so the, I think the best thing about 
actually having a job and an opportunity to build a career is that it's just um, it's an enabler to to dream and to begin to pursue those dreams. Thanks, Adam. That's completely true. I feel that being employed full time makes you a part of society. Like you, you have a purpose, and um, part of something bigger than yourself. And particularly being in an organisation as large as mine, the Victorian government, you feel like you're something a lot bigger than yourself. I'm still learning about all the different departments, and I've been there a year. So um, the DHHS alone employs thousands and thousands of people. So I'm a very small cog in a very large machine, but a very important cog, because the records we make the metadata for are used by all kinds of people, requested by people all across the government. So I feel I am making a difference. And aside from the work that I'm employed to do, uh, we've done a lot of extracurricular stuff for the government as well. So we've been involved with the VPS Enablers Network. Their goal is to try and increase the visibility and the status of people with disabilities in the government. So they want to increase the numbers of people employed with disabilities in the government. And myself and some of my colleagues have also um, helped to establish a kind of a support union for people with autism in the VPS, which we're really proud of doing. So it's, it's an enabler, as you said. Um, helps you pay the bills, as <laughs> Rochelle said. It, um, and apart from that, it just gives you a sense of purpose and that your life's moving forwards. For a long time, mine wasn't really moving forwards. Um, it, I had a very spotty track record with careers. I used to work as an ESL teacher, but even in that field, I found work wasn't the most stable. Like I'd have contracts for six months here or there. And I was just looking for some kind of normalcy and stability. And I feel that this role has given me that. So I'm very grateful. Great. So the best thing about working um, for me would have to be structure and routine. Yeah. <laughs> I am a very structured person. I like to know where I'm going to be at what time and what that my day is going to look like. Um, obviously, in a workplace, that can be difficult because anything can change at any time. Um, so I guess being in the workforce, um, it has enabled me to sometimes have to think outside of the box and changes are always going to happen, whether I like them or not. <laughs> um, it's not something that I can change. So it has helped me to grow as a person um, and aspire to just do better um, because you can always do better. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh, the best thing I find about working, at least at SAP, is really the atmosphere and the people. It's a really great atmosphere. It makes me want to go to work. It makes me uh, enjoy what I do, even if it can be very stressful and challenging at times. And I just really love working there. So that really keeps me motivated and working the extra hours, as you're all aware, that can uh, balloon out of control very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and I also really enjoy the fact that I get to work with leaders in their field and everyone there is very experienced and very happy to help in almost any situation that you That's run great. across. I mean, I find that a very valuable experience. Excellent. Um, hmm. So they're, they're the positives. What are the, what are some of the challenges that you might uh, encounter in, in your in day-to-day -day working. <laughs> Bit of a swing there. <laughs> uh, That's life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my biggest challenges are really just really explaining my thought process to people. It makes perfect sense to me, but as you try to explain it to other people, say why you did this or why you think we should do it this way, you can run across some uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. It's getting better as uh, you get to know each other, but it's always going to maintain a quite a big uh, position in that challenging list. Mm. And so how have you found what's helped you be able to um, get those thoughts across mm. and the process across? One of my favourite things is uh, if it's not a meeting, we go out for coffee. Mm -hmm. We uh, just chat about some things as we uh, relax a bit and then continue trying to explain it on the way back. And I found that generally seems to help. Great. It's just when we're not all zeroed in on the solution and just trying to get it done. Excellent. Okay. 
Brittany, do you want to talk a little bit about maybe some challenges? Yeah, so I probably, my main challenge is um, different personalities in the workplace. Um, you're obviously different, dealing with um, a variety of different people um, and every day, I guess it's hard to understand um, what they really mean, um, whether they're coming across as rude, um, whether they're being sarcastic or whether they're actually being genuine. I've found that um, even throughout school has been a, a major um, barrier in school as well as now um, the workplace. So yeah, that's probably my main. Biggest challenges, okay. Um I still have to think about that one. Um, uh, yeah, uh, as Brittany said, differing personalities. Uh, everyone that I've worked with has been very friendly so far. Uh, I, I, I don't have a problem fitting in with the team. Uh, that's not a problem. Uh, I'm, I'm having trouble thinking of challenges. Uh, but could you come back to me? <laughs> okay. Couple things. Uh, one, as Brittany said, um, just working with managing personalities, and um, and within that, I think Brittany kind of touched on it. But um, within that managing of interpreters, like we tend to tell it like it is, right? Um, and that can often be interpreted as being unkind, rude, overly direct. It's not. It's just factual, right? There's no tone. There's no tone. Don't don't put tone in because there isn't there. It's not there, right? We don't do. We just people ask us a question, we give you an honest answer. It's just the way it is. But actually managing the expectations around that's really important, which leads me back to disclosure. Why disclosure is really important because it's much easier to have a conversation about that with someone when you don't have to actually background that whole conversation with the fact that you're autistic. And that because you're autistic, the, 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 an, an impact of being autistic and working with me as an autistic person is this. And now I can talk to you about w w some reasons around why that might be that and that actually I'm not being rude or I'm not being unkind. I'm not being negative. I'm just actually being factual and articulating that. So I think that's one side of it. The other side of it I think is for, and I think this is particularly for me and perhaps for others that are more in my age bracket than Jan's age bracket, um, is because you're that age, you're in an organisation, particularly in a corporate like ANZ, um, there's kind of an expectation that you know all the language that goes around business and you know all the language about those things. So kind of it's a, there's, <laughs> when you come into an organisation, there's got a big steep learning curve on getting what, um, those, what that language means. And within that language, there's a lot of idioms. There's a lot of metaphor. Uh, it's not that we can't understand metaphor. I get metaphor really easily, but I need to think about it. I need to learn it. Um, uh, a friend at, who's now a friend at CR, Autism CRC, she says, you always get these idioms and metaphors really easy. I said, yeah, I did. I do, but I get them because my family used them a lot and I learnt them. It's not, be, but I still actually have to catch myself from jumping to a literal interpretation first, and I have to go. Oh no, no, it doesn't actually mean pull my socks up. It <laughs> means you know. And when someone says in a meeting at the end of the day, they actually mean down the future when we get to the end of this plan or sometime at the end of this project, not at the end of the day. So I think um, there are a couple of challenges. Like they're not really significant big ones, but they're there. And just one final thing I think around is um, advocating for um, adaptations and accommodations. So I, I actually, ANZ is pretty good, right? Um, the way we, the way our, we have a fairly flexible working practice. So some things uh, you don't really have to explain, like, we already have lots of people that work from home every day, so I actually don't need to explain that I need to work from home because I just need to work from home without people. Um, like it's actually a, it's actually a release valve for me sometimes to do that because it's too much to come in the office and deal and deal with people. Um, but then there are other things like explaining that actually no, th this seating position is no good. I can't deal with that glare. Um, and again, it comes back to disclosure, right? If you've disclosed, it's much easier to have that conversation. Um, but and I will background again the fact that you need to make sure when you disclose, it's a safe situation to do so. 
And yeah, oh, sorry, go for it. Okay, so one issue for me is that of uh, burnout. Because uh, I come across as very social a lot of the time. and what, I'll talk to anybody, but there are times when I, I just have to have a moment by myself. And that's difficult in a workplace, especially when you're in such a big workplace. Mm. And um, so when what, you're in what, cubicles what, amongst other people. What, what do you do? Uh, sometimes I have to go and take five, just go for a break, because, yeah. because there's people around you just get a bit overwhelming. Not because I don't like them, or because uh, anything they've done wrong. It's just sometimes for autistic people, we get overstimulated, we get burnt out. Even people that sometimes appear social like myself. <laughs> so sometimes I have to go and hide for a bit. Okay. That was particularly challenging back when I was teaching. Like in front of 30 students every day, I had to just go and hide in my office for a while afterwards. Right. Um, Jan, tell us a little bit about any um, challenges and then any accommodations that um, have right, occurred yeah. at ANZ. Um, uh, this will, yeah, kind of be, well, again, my situation here is um, kind of, oh, well, actually, no, it's not different from Rose, because uh, I'm essentially talking about, yeah, issues working at um, the, the organisation that I'm actually disclosing them at, so um, <laughs> people are looking around <laughs> nervously. Um, no, 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 no. Um, it, it, it's... <laughs> it's, um, it's, look, uh, I think probably all, like, the all of the things that I find difficult in the workplace can be re-expressed in terms of um, my discomfort in, in admitting that, that I have these kind of discomforts. Um, it's, it ties into what um, Ro has said about um, discomfort in, in um, disclose like, issues in disclosing that one has autism or something uh, along those lines. Um, but um, in, in, in terms of my particular um, issues that I have um, whilst working, it, it, they can just take the form of um, either uh, environmental um, issues that that, that come with um, working in all of the wonderful open plan offices that take up whole floors across cores of this uh, of this building. Um, oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, also, I guess I've uh, ten I've tended to find that I do I can occasionally have. Um, trouble staying on task at times due to, um, well, I, gu I guess what could be described as a comorbidity um, with having intrusive thoughts, which uh, may or may not be related to issues with um, emotional regulation. Um, but um, yeah, I think, I think that would just be better managed in in myself coming to the realization that it's okay to actually um, be kind of open about these things, um, and um, just trying to maintain a personal relationship with with one's. Um, line managers or one's leads in a way that that isn't too um, rigid and that you can actually try to build a, a, a genuine um, sort of business relationship with or um, interpersonal relationship with so that you, you do feel comfortable uh, in addressing the issues that you have. Um, I think, yeah, these are just things that I... Um, feel I still need to work on. That's it. Thank you. So um, I think that w we could really go on, and I think everyone would like to, to, to continue hearing stories. I think I'll we'll ask you each one last question, I guess, um, before we wrap up. So what advice would you have for anyone who's out there who's thinking about recruiting people um, with autism? What advice would you give them? 
Okay. Well, um, again, I I don't have that much experience from the the point of view of an employer, and there is obviously a lot of uh, interpersonal. Well, there is a lot of um, diversity across um, the characteristics of individuals with autism, but I I think. Um, if if I were to pin anything down, it would just be to not. I I think that there's 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 a tendency of of organisations who want to reach out to the um, autistic community to deal with these things, to deal with these issues with uh, kid gloves. I, I I would I would assume and. Um, Perhaps that's something that needs to be reconsidered. Um, again, I probably don't have the, the most informed opinions, but um, yeah, I'll let Carl speak. Thanks, Jan. I got two things. <laughs> um, the first is about um, programs such as the Spectrum program, Dandelion program, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's great they exist, but we should be in a world where they don't. We should be in a world where our talent and culture or human resources, wh whatever their label is in your organisation, have been transformed so that any person with any disability or any diversity issue can identify that issue and, a, and an alternative process for recruitment kicks into place. Because the reality is if, if I'm recruiting for a job, I want the best person for that role, right? And in order to get that best person, all of those candidates need to be able to put forward their best in order to present themselves and why they are the best person for that role, why they believe they fit that role, why they believe they have the skills. If we continue down a road of standard old, every person gets the same interview and supposedly this is a merit-based selection, but it's not. That's not a merit-based selection for an autistic person. It's just not. That not, that's, doesn't put me as an autistic person on the same footing as someone else, it just doesn't. So that's the first thing. I love that the Spectrum program has been born, but I, I long for the day it's no longer needed and that our talent and culture organisation is able to flex and adapt to provide the best recruitment experience for all candidates. Uh, the number two is, if you're looking at reaching out for autistic people, there's a very good chance that the, those autistic people you have are not going to be necessarily white, cis, male. They're very likely. 35% uh, of the autistic community are LGBTIQ. So think about how your organisation embraces diversity and inclusion on a broad scale and think about how you need to impact the culture of your organisation so that when you recruit that autistic person, regardless of whether they're straight or not straight, that they will actually be supported not just by talent and culture and um, any employee assistance programs or their direct line managers, but by the organisation as a whole, by those around them. Build a culture that, that's a really important thing. But we need to build cultures in all our organisations that are about inclusion and diversity. And also I would add respect for all each other's because <laughs> the reality is it's actually good business, right? We know there's research out there that says diverse teams produce better results. So let's change our organisations so that they are about, so that they not just support but embrace diversity so that we get a better bottom line at the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, on that note, um I think we need to smash through many of the stereotypes that still exist. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of myths that still abound about the spectrum, such as we all have we're genius. All yeah, we're all genius level IT or mathematics or or something of that sort. Whereas autism is really a spectrum, right? We're all as diverse as anybody else is. So um, I myself am more into the English language rather than maths. I'm not particularly good at maths at all. So. Um, I encourage employers to see the diversity within the spectrum itself and consider us for roles other than just IT. So following on from that, um, I believe that an organisation um, should 
encourage um, and bring awareness um, around autism to the organisation so people um, are aware because obviously there are people out there that have no idea. Um, they tend to stereotype. Um, so number one is awareness. But I'd also encourage every company out there to think about the positions that they have that would be suited for an individual with autism, not necessarily in IT, um, but any field within the company because they make some of the most driven, um, dedicated employees you'll ever meet. The tendency, I guess, is to place them into a pigeonhole type job, um, but aim high and help them aspire for better jobs that have meaning for a company. There's no need to relate relegate people with autism to the back of the office. Um, people on the spectrum can be some of the most delightful and friendliest people. So being greeters in the front of a store or other people orientated positions can be a great asset to the company. Um, until they employ, they have no idea. <laughs> Speaking on of uh, the journey to employment is more with the interview process. As uh, was mentioned a bit earlier, most of our interview processes that are currently around do not uh, completely capture someone's potential, especially someone on the spectrum. So always think of a, maybe a different way to do a standard interview so you can be sure that you're letting them put their best foot forward so they can basically improve your bottom line. Thank you. Thank you. So um, that was a, 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 just a wonderful um, collection of stories and, and insights into employment. Um, please join me in thanking um, these wonderful people. <laughs>